much for joining. We are here with Commissioner Wilson. Happy Friday. Happy New Year. We have Happy seen New you. Year. This year this week has been so busy, but yes, Happy New Year. How did you celebrate? Oh, little teeny tiny mm -hmm. celebration, which actually is sort of like, I think we talked about this beforehand. It's sort of what I like anyway, because my dogs get super anxious in the fireworks. So we kind of need to be there for them. And the louder it is at our house, the worse that gets. So we did a very quiet mm -hmm. new year and, um, you know, ate some appetizers and went to bed at like 1245. So I made it to 2021 and <laughs> very glamorous. That's great. How about you? Uh, champagne, my favorite part of New Year's, a little champagne toast with uh, my boyfriend, Ernest, who is helping us. Thank you, Ernest, for your Thank hard you work, Ernest. the man behind the scenes. And um, yeah, just very grateful for the opportunity to work with you. Oh. I don't want to get emotional, but yeah, like, I feel the same way. This year has been taxing emotionally, and I think <sighs> given the opportunity to meet you and see how hard you work, it's been the greatest gift of 2020. It's gonna make me cry, because <laughs> I do, I feel, I, I, I feel the same way. And Anne's in this room also, and I just, I feel the same way, Lee, and, and I just feel like um, I have optimism, I have anxiety also, mm -hmm. but I think that comes with that. I think, you know, I wanna make sure that I understand the gravity of some of the issues. So, mm -hmm. and I just am so grateful mm -hmm. for you and that we have moved into this new year and um, I think there's, you know, I feel like there's some really good things coming up, so. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you feel about the first week of the year so far? How has everything been, you know? Oh, so, <laughs> in case you haven't had your own news on, it was a little bit of a wild and woolly week. Um, I don't want to get into, obviously, the sort of national stories. I know you all have had opportunity and <laughs> probably a little bit more information than you uh, ever thought you would need about the news this week. I just want to say something about us locally. Um, one of the things that we did this week was we had the opportunity to swear in our constitutional officers mm -hmm. here in Orange County. Um, that includes our county comptroller, our mm -hmm. tax collector, our property mm -hmm. appraiser, and our supervisor of elections. And I bring this up now because I want to say that more than ever, I want people who are watching this and are out there to have confidence in our voting system. Our democracy works because we guard our democracy. Our democracy works because we have systems in place that they do need oversight. We do have oversight. I think there was so much misinformation about the voting process this mm -hmm. year because we understandably during a pandemic expanded early voting we expanded mail-in voting it doesn't mean that those things were inaccurate they were very accurate i think a lot of times what happens is because the constitution of the united states only really tells us what day we vote on mm -hmm. it doesn't give us any other instructions so typically the states have been able to do their own processes, which for people who understand states' rights, and I think that's kind of a, a drumbeat you hear often, then you understand that each state has its own challenges, trying to make sure that a population is being represented. And so those need to be a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. In the state of Florida, our counties, our county supervisors are the guardians of our democracy and are in charge of all those inner processes. And I. Um, I know some of my friends know this. I had the opportunity to be in election um, to do um, uh, observation a couple years ago. And Bill Cowles at the time absolutely blew me away and with his efficiency and proficiency and his mm -hmm. the ability to make sure that there were um, checks and balances and everything was done precisely. And that continues. And he was sworn in, Bill Cowles was sworn in for another term mm -hmm. this week. And I just want people to feel comforted that their election process is working, that that is an absolute um, important thing to understand because if you quit believing that it's working and quit voting, then it doesn't work. And that's how democracies die. Mm -hmm. And that's why our enemies, and I mean out of this country enemies, mm -hmm. want to undermine our democracy by um, starting what are largely false conspiracy theories about things mm -hmm. so that we start to question things that are absolutely established, supervised, factually checked, 
and and you should have complete confidence in them. So sorry mm -hmm. I fell down that that rabbit hole, but I think it's really an important thing, th knowing that we're swearing in some of these people this week. Well, I mean, this is something that me, I just turned 30 years old, so I and right now, you know, I have issues with conspiracy theorists in my family. And I just want to say that I grew up kind of in that mindset that like our vote doesn't matter. Like it's just a waste of time because that's what we were always told that we were in this perpetual state of of poverty and that there was no way to crawl out of it and that our vote didn't matter. As a young adult now and getting, especially in this job, when you organize with your community and you have a unified voice among many of your fellow neighbors and other residents, people within the county listen and they, they get worried and they want to fix whatever yeah. you're organizing about. Yeah, you get to pick who represents you in a representative mm -hmm. democracy and I know that the electoral college is archaic. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are you know, some major problems there. But I think this year, one of the things that we really need to look at as a huge silver lining and a mm -hmm. takeaway mm -hmm. is the voter turnout was higher than ever. And that's across the board. That means all demographics, all socioeconomic levels. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that you know, if people weren't happy with the outcome of this election, it may have been that they weren't happy with the choice of the majority of those people, mm -hmm. not that something had gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I think it's, you know, to your point, I think when, when a family is struggling with putting food on a table or making sure their power stays on, the distant decisions being made in Tallahassee mm -hmm. or in Washington just feel very foreign, abstract and, inconsequential mm -hmm. and I think you know we have to make sure that even the people who are feeling hungry mm -hmm. and who are wondering what's going to happen next with their power still have that voice so all the opportunities that we made available because of the pandemic as far as our early voting our additional voting sites and our um, mail-in votes that, that we continue to pursue making sure that every vote is is counted and that all those people who don't think that they can vote because they don't have a car or that they don't have um you know that there's mm -hmm. some there's some qualification that comes with that property whatever it is no we don't have poll taxes no mm -hmm. those votes matter and that's how that representation that's how we can you know in, in incremental changes are still changes mm -hmm. so and i think um you know moving into the next election season uh, when i was speaking with um, supervisor of election cows i bragged about how great it was to be able to go to um, the amway arena to vote with my daughter on her 18th birthday Mm -hmm. And it felt like this really emotional, monumental mm -hmm. thing to walk in. And there was a, um, a young dad there with his daughter on his hip. And the dad said, look, you'll, you'll, you'll be with me someday. We'll go vote to his little, you know, four-year-old, five-year-old daughter. And, you know, I'm just crying because <laughs> to me that was, it just felt like the best of America um, that we were able to take you know, spaces that maybe weren't being used because we're in this health crisis and, and, and take that opportunity to make our democracy work better. And so people could walk there from neighborhoods in the downtown area and, and there were voting booths, you know, that were, there was no line. So people felt safe and they could vote without feeling like they were being exposed. And um, a supervisor of election cows said, you know, going forward that they are gonna continue to look for those opportunities. And that does come down to um, these local supervisors of elections, these, some of these operational uh, uh, plans. So stay plugged in. These are things that we literally mm -hmm. um, can continue to watch the development of. And I think about, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act and how important it was. And, and when, we, when we decided to water down the Voting Rights Act, it was, it was like watching people slipping backwards. And I think this election more than anything in a long time, I felt like we were gaining some ground in, in, in making voting accessible to all people mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and not, you know, slamming doors on people. We still have work to do, but yeah. Um, I just want to take a moment to say congratulations to, um, property appraiser, uh, Amy Mercado, 
Comptroller Phil Diamond, Clerk of the Courts Tiffany Russell, Supervisor of Elections Bill Cowles, and Tax Collector Scott Randolph for, you know, your oath of office this week. It was great. The, um, I believe um, Amy Mercado, I think, organized having it outside, outdoors, mm -hmm. so that it could be um, attended by a handful of family members and the media was there and there was an opportunity for them to to be together as the constitutional officers here in Orange County and Orange County is is unique in that we have an elected comptroller that you know is the oversight and that we have um, so they really all work hand in hand um, and I know that once again it's not perfect I'm not saying it's not but I do feel like seeing that type of a swearing-in ceremony where people are really in a collaborative spirit gives me great optimism mm -hmm. Um, moving forward with your week, I know it's been crazy, you know, everything that happened in D.C. and all over the news, you know, I don't know if you wanted to touch on kind of your stance on how you feel about that, but. So sad, boy, you know, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it felt sad. I was like, I think everybody, I think everybody, and I, I, I have family and friends on both sides of the aisle. And I think I, I come from a family where debating is good, that we can come with our own opinions and I can disagree with you and mm -hmm. we can still walk away knowing that we love our country and that we love mm -hmm. our children and we love our and, and we want to plan a future and that um, and that those things are hammered out on the floor of the Senate, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. not hammered into the yeah. floor of the Senate. And so it was it was devastating to see. I think um, I think we all have a responsibility to confront um, conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists. And when I say that, I don't mean confront like as in physically confront. What I mean is that if you hear somebody talking about something and it's factually inaccurate and you think it's a dangerous conspiracy theory, it's okay to ask what were your sources. Mm -hmm. And I and I think it's so crazy because you go back to the things you learned in high school, cite your sources. Mm -hmm. And if the first source doesn't look so credible, come up with a second site. Mm -hmm. And if that one doesn't look so credible, go for a third. If you can't get to a third site, it's not a fact. And, and, and I think it also goes back to, um, you know, there's second grade exercises that I remember uh, working through with my kids about fact and opinion. And we all really, um, you know, you flip on cable and you see um, people behind a desk espousing something. And I think there was a time that may have been more factual. Now it may be more opinion. But sometimes a good exercise is for yourself before you repeat something or do a click and, and move on mm -hmm. is to do a little research and that's okay. Find out, mm -hmm. is that fact or opinion? Because we can agree to disagree about the opinion part of it, but facts are facts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when a court of law says there is no issue with the outcome of this election and they have a factual record, then that is just factual. And so that, that's not up for debate. And I think, um, I think that was a hard part for me. I, I believe in the rule of law and I, I am, you know, loyal to our constitution. I, I took an oath when I was sworn into office, but even before then, I've always been a, a geek for constitutional history. And so I'm, I'm protective of that. And mm -hmm. I think people who believed that somehow destroying what was our constitutional um, process was mm -hmm. patriotic was just mm -hmm. very perverse. That was a very perverse action. And I hope that the lessons moving forward for us are that we have to work together and that we have to protect the democratic institutions that provide us with a structure that we can use that con that constitution every day to make our lives better mm -hmm. and 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 fulfill the destiny that, of America, which mm -hmm. needs work still, but there is a destiny there which includes um, some of those great tenants that were um, the processes that were going on that day, right? Which I don't know if you saw the footage of the the pages, the young people. They were probably your age, and, you know, maybe a little younger. Were tasked with while people were crashing through windows and, and, you know, creating chaos with taking lock boxes of electoral votes into a secure location. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I hope we look back on, on that with some lessons and I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to our lawmakers that, mm -hmm. that came back that night and finished their constitutional duty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it comes to the people who say they're originalists, <laughs> And then that's just kind of a thing because they want to say that. Mm -hmm. Originalism is doing our constitutional duty to count those electoral votes on the day that they are said to be counted. Um, and so it, it happened And that, mm -hmm. that it was very tense and scary. Mm -hmm. but how about you? I mean, I, I want to say I'm 
my condolences to the the families of the those who whose lives were lost i believe that it's now at four individuals including five. oh five plus an officer was included in that my condolences because i really just never in my wildest dreams thought i would ever see something like that in my lifetime but um but it's also something that makes me respect you so much because you know you're allowing us to do this very transparent kind of vulnerable honest conversation where you're allowed you're taking questions from the audience and you're trying to set the bar at being that transparent honest open line of communication that's accessible to the people and if more of us had that i think that we wouldn't have escalated to what happened this past week if we all felt like we could just call up our commissioner or senator or whoever and really have someone look you in the eye and give you an answer i don't think things would escalate to the point where we're fear we're fear mongered and we're um fed misinformation and many people actually believe it yeah i think um um i think there was a vacuum filled by some of that i, I think you're right and i think this is it's on us right mm -hmm. as elected officials to try to make sure that our transparency resolves some of the questions that are posed i think sometimes you know that, that conspiracy theories are launched to undermine things for whatever mm -hmm. other motives but but i do believe that there is an issue with public trust in government mm -hmm. and i think that that that's on us to try to rebuild mm -hmm. um and i know that you know we we are in one corner of a, of a large county we have a huge county and so I, and I think we can do our part here and i think we can try to pick people when we go to vote that make us feel like they are giving us that that trust that transparency and then we can demand that um, without backfilling some conspiracies, right? Mm -hmm. We can demand it. If you mm -hmm. don't like what you're hearing, then you vote them out. Mm -hmm. You know, you vote them out. You get a coalition of people together, you find somebody that might want to be a candidate and you vote them out. And, and so, yes, I think public trust is going to be a, an ongoing issue in this country, it's, you know, locally, federally, mm -hmm. all the way up um, for the, the days to come. And I think hopefully there are lessons being learned by the people in public office that didn't understand that before this week. Yeah, and you know, um, I think just the fact that you, uh, you're you willing to talk about the process, what you do and do not know, you're very honest. You know, this, this past week was a lot. You, you went through a lot. Maybe we can start to touch on some of the things that you went through. Um, so you started out the week uh, going to the oath of office for these elected officials that we already uh, congratulated. Then you had a sit down with the Humane Society and talked a little bit about what they're working on in terms of banning puppy mills. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. We don't have puppy mills, or at least not to my knowledge. There's not a problem with the actual mills here in Orange County. But the, the mm -hmm. problem is that for as long as we allow retail outlets to sell puppies that come from wherever, mm -hmm. then we are the end, we are the end, um, uh, output of the puppy mill, which then means that we are feeding the puppy mill. So yes, it is a um, factually, <laughs> you know, you can check the facts on on data driven that in the communities that have um, banned retail outlet sales of puppies, um, that there are, you know, you basically have squeezed the market to make sure puppy mills are out. And this is something that I think is very near and dear to the hearts of so many of the friends and neighbors and constituents and residents all across Orange County because we love, we love our animals. We understand that there's a, a big difference in, um, you know, a reputable breeder or a, um, you know, sometimes there's a, a family member whose dog has had puppies mm -hmm. and going to a, uh, you know, a, a store where they have, um, you know, basically imported puppies mm -hmm. from, you know, a beleaguered and abused mother on a puppy mill somewhere, mm -hmm. usually out of state. And mm -hmm. the, the issue is bigger than just animal welfare, even though animal welfare is sort of where, you know, you jump into this because your heart really hurts, but mm -hmm. then you realize this is also a consumer protection issue. It's not cheap. You go in, they pull at your heart and you, and you pay big money, or sometimes you take a loan in order to be able to get one of these puppy mm -hmm. mill puppies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is sometimes a very ill animal, sadly, that has, you know, communicable diseases within other 
um, for other dogs in the household to catch or things that humans may even have to deal with. And um, so at the end of the day, as Orange County residents, our concern is that not only is your heart broken, mm -hmm. but you've also been you know, defrauded and we may have put some, some health at risk. And so looking at um, a way to try to make sure that we're not part of that puppy mill pipeline Mm -hmm. um, is a benefit to all Orange County residents. And so that's what we got to speak about this week. And there's a tremendous amount of research, if anyone's ever curious about it um, or wants to take a look at some of the other um, municipalities or um, cities and, and counties that have taken action on this, it, it's very informative and it allows us to see what was done right and mm -hmm. how the outcomes have been beneficial for those areas. Yeah, I mean, these animals are living in spaces that are like six inches off their bodies so they're really tight confined spaces and many of them are pumped with antibiotics which then lead to different diseases that are immune to different antibiotics that you would give a human that might contract something from these diseased dogs that you might not even realize because they look healthy until you know they start to get their steroids and antibiotics fading out and you realize it's actually very sick and I think one of the, tragic. the biggest things that really caught my attention in that meeting was how, you know, they were saying that in order to pass something, you kind of have to make the case that when you try to take a living species and make it a commodity yes. for profit, you have to clearly define yes. what that means. And then you start to tiptoe into animal agriculture issues. Right. and conditions and that's where there's a lot of money kind of backing the, the norms right that you know a lot of us feel you know need to be addressed but there's powers that be that want to make sure that they're just looked at like a like an object right and it's you know it, it's interesting because um some of the supporters of this type of of ordinance that would would ban a, um, a retail outlet from selling puppy mill puppies and um, it actually brings to the table interestingly uh, the pet stores that that have shelters or adopted animals that come in because you know they have a completely different business model and they have an interest obviously in in making sure that when they you know that they are providing um, oftentimes food and um, uh, toys and supplies that they are also because they invite dogs in that they are part of an you know a a system that is for the benefit of those animals and for also the consumers of the people that come in and shop there so you know for anybody who has some you know concern about whether or not this would be um, an adverse movement to retail it's really not because there is you know some a great deal of retail that happens outside of those type of, of puppy sales where um, they're doing a great job of making sure they're also giving a um, a location for shelter animals to come and be adopted and to get their own platform and to be seen mm -hmm. so yeah it's a, it, it's really something that i think it, it brings an interesting collaboration to the table the flip side of that is um, what Lee was mentioning that, you know, there are, you know, many things that overlay laws and um, ordinances that overlay what we import. And when you look at a product that's sold in the end point and try to affect that, how many different players come in along that way? You know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you have a, a puppy mill somewhere that's usually out of state, um, but you also end up in animal transport and you have um, you know, you have somebody that's uh, usually there's a handler here, you know, on the other end. And mm -hmm. so there are so many different um, players that go into that. Uh, but the, the hope is that if you put something in place that doesn't allow that, that end point, the retail end point, the payoff, mm -hmm. that you have cut off that, that, that pipeline of um, animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, you know, it d takes the incentive away for um, the rest of those people that are in it for making money I mean there's a lot of work to be done there um, and I'm you know I'd like to segue a little bit into some of the concerns that a lot of constituents have brought into light you know most of the inquiries that come in are with regards to traffic lights 
dangerous intersections, um, flooding issues. Those are like the, the top three, which of course, please email district one at ocfl.net. That's why we're here. Yeah, it's literally. Yeah, we're not minimizing any of that. There's big issues, but man, we know that the, the stuff that happens right outside your door mm -hmm. is, is really is important. And we will make sure that we're, we're working mm -hmm. on those. It's incredible how fast they say the county works slow, but I don't think so. Like when I when I send an email out to traffic and engineering, shout out to those teams with public works, they reply right away. Um, and if you're able to get your neighbors involved on an issue and do your homework and, and do a lot of that footwork, things go even farther, even faster because you're organizing your community, you know. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But one of the other meetings that we had was with um, Don and Connor from Noah's Notes who were talking about some um, some animal mortalities and some actually public safety issues along Reams Road. I didn't know if you wanted to touch on that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, this is a really important issue and I know the people who live in Horizon West, there are so many gro growing pain um, issues that, that have bubbled up and we are really trying to sort and, and make sure that we're doing the, our best job of addressing those. Um, Noah's Notes and the people that that um, that work there do an amazing job of putting together factual record of what is going on as far as the wildlife mortality in a certain area. Mm -hmm. The it, this happens to be Reams Road, which um, for people that live in that area know that um, you know not too long ago, it was not very traveled. And the the number of cars and trips on that road now mm -hmm. is, is going up and up. And what Noah's notes, they've broken it down to, um, you know, not just the species and the number of animals that mm -hmm. have died um, as a result of traffic incidents, but they've also really parsed out exactly geographically where that's happening along that road. Mm -hmm. And then they take a step back from there and look at the um, the actual waterway, conservation tracks, and wildlife corridor, and how all those things intersect mm -hmm. to explain why the animals that are being hit are being hit where they're being hit. Mm -hmm. So not only did they do all that really homework. a ton of lifting on the data and research about the animals and which kind of animals and how mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know how critical these animals are to our ecosystems but they also really did a great job of breaking down for us the localities that we need to look at to figure out what mm -hmm. is um, the best way to make sure we're not allowing this to continue it's tragic when you look at how many protected species mm -hmm. and and even you know even the ones that aren't shouldn't be hit on the road it's mm -hmm. it's tragic and it's a, and it's once again you know you don't have to just isolate that as a reason it's also it means that somebody's car is involved in an incident and there have been accidents out there that as a result of the same issues that are affecting the wildlife human life and human welfare are, are at risk so when we approach that it's not just with a singular vision even though i think that it you know it's a very um it gives a very strong strong argument to exactly how important the wildlife corridor is mm -hmm. and how important it is that our mm -hmm. waterways remain flowing the way they were supposed to in, intend to flow because without it, we're forcing animals out onto the road. Mm -hmm. um, but it also illustrates when you look at it side by side with where we are looking to develop or talking about developing in the future, where are we going to sever that corridor and how are we going to make sure we're not severing that corridor or mm -hmm. this is there's no there's not going to be a solution. So, you know, once, you know, once we really get a chance to um, look at some of those parcels in that area i'm hopeful that we can find a way to make sure that we aren't going to sever that corridor and in the meantime we've had we had a meeting or mm -hmm. um, actually because i had a, a conflict lee spoke with um our connection at or our contact at the sheriff's department we're going to continue to work alongside of the orange county sheriff in order to make sure that the speeds that are already posted out there are being obeyed if there's other um sort of uh, low-hanging fruit in ways that we can decrease that mortality we're going to try to really get that done quickly mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. am i missing even you know even just slow lowering the uh you know th this is what i love about this constituent 
he created short-term and long-term potential goals with estimated trajectories on how many animals would be saved and how much traffic would, you know, be alleviated and, and, you know, there's all that work and time and energy, it really helps. And he got a lot of people in the community involved. And, you know, I think that this could definitely be an example of how we help educate other constituents on how to face their future problems as well. I agree. And I think even that, even nonprofit groups in trying to figure out how to um, mm -hmm. demonstrate that things that affect our mm -hmm. natural world also impact, you know, human activity and human mobility. Mm -hmm. because they're all tied together but without some kind of a factual record the way that they put one together sometimes that's hard to demonstrate and you know it's i, I like the idea of people doing the right thing by our wildlife mm -hmm. but if we can't get it done without just saying this is important because it's important then we need to demonstrate all the reasons it's important and uh, noah's notes did a great job of really being able to put together a factual record of mm -hmm. of that data from you know from years back mm -hmm. so you're seeing the growth and then the result of that growth. I'm excited to like read the code and learn how, whether or not, which I really don't think that we as humans have really designed the code to take into consideration animal behavior. Like one of the things that he brought up was how the, the underground t tunnels that the water feeds through to get under the road are now a perfect snapping point for alligators to grab like otters and yeah. such. So now they've learned how to use this trap to get the otters to come in so they can nab them. So the otters are now going over the road. Yes, because they're smart. Because they're, they're smart. <laughs> and, you know, and so like the code doesn't take into consideration this animal behavior. That's right. I mean, it's all of our, pretty much all of our property law is very human centric because it it, it is a, the way that when we got to an area, how are we going to use that area? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to use that area to benefit us? And, 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 you know, not to say that human law isn't to make sure that humans are doing what they're supposed to be doing, because it is, but understanding better about our interaction with wildlife and mm -hmm. in, our, in wildlife's interaction with each other, mm -hmm. we, can, we can get to some, I think, good resolution. I mean, the things that, that we talked about that could potentially make a difference were, weren't impossibilities, right? They, they were just changes in design, sometimes changes in function, but they were not impossibilities. So I think we can, without throwing out the baby in the bathwater, we can go back and look at that code that is so human centric and find opportunities to make sure that we've incorporated, um, I think the needs and, and, and risks to our, our natural world. And I think if we don't, we're really gonna be in big trouble. And I've said this, this was a, mm -hmm. a big point that I made when we were trying to get the, um, right to clean water amendment passed was that we don't have any alternatives. You know, if you think about this as, as something that's an option, then you don't, these are critical. We, we don't have, without clean water, we don't have life. Without mm -hmm. uh, clean air, which our forests provide, then, you know, our lung issues are gonna continue. Mm -hmm. You know, we're gonna, breathing is always gonna be an issue. So, so these aren't things that we have long-term, we have to come up with a way to to cohabitate and to make sure that we're considering the natural world. Mm -hmm. And District 1 is so vocal. I, I think I'm so honored because I, working from the nonprofit world into government, I was really scared that a huge environmental piece of me would have to be put on the shelf. But so many constituents email saying, we want to preserve nature. Yeah. We want to preserve. And they're so vocal about yeah. that. Yeah, and it, exactly. And I think they, many, many, many of them moved to that area because of some of those natural treasures and they're very fearful that mm -hmm. that the, the rapid change and and mm -hmm. the lack of consideration for some of those natural mm -hmm. you know beautiful things are, are gonna it, they're gonna change the entire landscape of their you know what they fell in love with when they got there so even our even our newest residents you know i think it's an it's a it's an interesting thing that we hear the same um goals, concerns from people who have been here for several generations and from people who just moved here. And it, it is largely about that, about mm -hmm. making sure that it is um, our, natural, our natural world stays intact and is protected. So I want to segue into your budget meeting. You kind of had an overview of the county's budget. It, you could have probably spent like a whole week in that meeting, 
Um, but I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because you also went and toured the convention center. Yes. You know, and I feel like, um, you know, when it comes, great. especially amidst COVID, which we'll talk about the COVID briefing that you received too, there's been a lot of changes in the budget. Things are happening really quickly. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised at how aware and proactive the staff and the you know, fiscal services and budgetary staff. It's just incredible. I agree. And I think I get very intimidated by the type of budget we work he with here in Orange County. It, you know, I, it, we have such a, we have a duty, fiduciary duty to our constituents and to make sure that we're being mm -hmm. um, as um, cautious and having that kind of oversight. And then you meet with people in, in the budget office and, and it does bring you a sense of comfort in knowing how um, how diligent they are, how precise they are, and that we have a comptroller as well that 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 oversees many of those things. And so I think it, it was um, interesting this week to be able to really look at a calendar and understand how a, a calendar budget year works. Um, that July is sort of our big, you know, lock it in day. That that um, for us working for District One, that departments that we may need to work with on budget items that we need to queue those things up in the in the coming months mm -hmm. uh, i'm sure parks and rec is going to be a, a big one i mm -hmm. think um you know we look we talk about the transportation and and uh and public works so we sort of got a better snapshot of how that process comes you know around within a year and then we also got what sort of our in-house budget looks like and how we operate as a as a district office so it was it was another one of those puzzle pieces that came together that i found you know, it's a lot of information. Once again, it was comforting to get the information and now we know exactly how that calendar works and, and you know, what the processes are to make sure that we can move forward with any projects we have. I thought it was, uh, you know, fascinating to hear about how different things got within that budget as a result of COVID. And, and that's, you know, in a good and bad way, obviously there were significant setbacks in the tourist development tax, otherwise known as the TDT. <laughs> But seeing what happened when the CARES Act um, was put into place and the funds that came in and then where they were allocated and, and how, mm -hmm. how important it was for uh, um, the people in different departments here to make sure that, that they took on a different role, getting those allocations where they needed to be or else we lose those. So that was a really um, important piece of that was to see how quickly they could get that in and back out into our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a very in-depth COVID briefing that I think is just, it, it astounds me how you could be working a job here at the county and think everything's fine in January and February of last year. And then all of a sudden within a month, your entire role changes yeah. across over a few hundred employees here at the county. That's right. And I, and I, it just blows me away every day that I meet somebody else who says my job is this, but this last 10 months I've been doing this. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's a, um, you know, a, an overall, I mean, I know that the, sometimes the divisions are what makes the news, but there was a lot of unity in coming together and making sure that people were being mm -hmm. flexible in order to keep operations going and to try to put any resources they could back out into our community. I mean, mm -hmm. um, hearing about the repurposing of the correctional, um, uh, work program in order to be able to process um, applications and I mean from from top to bottom um, all of the the restructuring that went in in order to get through that and you know I think there's a lot of lessons there that heaven forbid we are faced with something like this again and we're not out of it yet but heaven forbid I think that they got they they they've got a way to do it I mean it's an amazing thing to see those processes come into place yeah and apparently you know they've dispersed over 15 million masks prioritizing small businesses first, um, over 2 uh, million bottles of hand sanitizer, um, doing upwards of 60,000 plus tests, over 2,000 tests per day now they're at, which is just fascinating to me. And, you know, there's definitely some updates that I know um, Ann took the time to put together and, and print out for you. Um, I, I want to quickly also talk about the um, mm -hmm. the vaccination process. I know that we started, mm -hmm. the, the portal opened mm -hmm. very quickly, was swamped, and the, the app either, you know, crashed on some people, you know, shut down for, for a while. I have heard from people that got through. I've heard, I heard from people that were frustrated, and, and 
understandably, it's very anxiety prov provoking. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for continuing to reach out to us so that we can learn also how to help other people navigate the system. Thank you for letting me know. I had a constituent that wrote a hand note saying that he and his wife had, a, had an outstanding experience, that they were able to register, and mm -hmm. that when they went in for the vaccine, that it was a very smooth process. I got to see it today. Mm -hmm. um, um, I got a tour of the kind of, not close up, I wasn't in where the cars are coming through, because nobody gets out of their car for their vaccine, but I got to see where they come into the convention center, um, the you know convention center is providing the structure, the, 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 um, the building, if you will, and then the parking lot outside where they stop and wait for 15 minutes to make sure that there's not a reaction. And the Department of Health is there with all of their resources. So it's, you know, it's another one of those collaborative efforts that um, Orange County has been doing since the beginning of COVID with the Department of Health in order to administer these vaccinations. They are gonna continue to ramp up the number of those that will open in a portal. And so what they wanted to make sure that they were doing um, and I know it was frustrating that the site didn't take, didn't stay open or didn't take as many mm -hmm. um, appointments as there were people, but they didn't want what you're seeing all across the state and country right now of having people put themselves at risk by going somewhere and having to be closer to other people and then not ending up getting the opportunity anyway because there wasn't a great appointment system. So what they've really tried to do is to have the logistics in place, the appointments um, in a in an orderly way so that when you come, I believe they said that um, at some point this morning, it was a 20 minute in and out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think at the height of the, the morning, the highest, the longest, it was a hour in and out. And that's, you know, once again, you're in your car and that includes a 15 minute wait uh, um, for to make sure there's no reaction. So um, I think that, that it's not perfect. They're really working hard to make sure that 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 supply line mm -hmm. continues to come in fighting i think really at every level to make sure that they are getting it out as quickly as possible and i think making sure that um, in the next in the coming days and weeks i'm um, trying to make sure there are other avenues for dissemination of the vaccine is, is a priority for for the uh, emergency services staff we got a lot of emails today of people saying that they were successfully able to register um, and that the process has been getting smoother. So that's a really good sign. Stay um, on, go on to the um, Orange County page. Their, their actual web page has um, where you can go. It's a third party app that, that does the appointments, but there's a ton of information on there and, um, and it's constantly updated. So, you know, I know we only do these once a week. We are, you know, they are updating that daily sometimes it's twice a day depending on what's going on and so we want to make sure that you know you get that the the most up to date there are um probably going to be like i said i think that appointment system is going to look the same in the next couple of rounds but they're going to be i'm sure updates as far as other disseminations because i think once we get past that first layer of the you know the governor ordered who the first group would would um, be eligible after that, there's going to be, you know, there's going to start broadening those um, categories. So that's going to be, I think, very, um, it's going to be happening in the next, let's mm -hmm. say, three weeks, a few weeks. Yeah, so just be careful of any scams, any, any type of scams where people might tell you that there's a fee for the vaccine or a different, the portal is called patientportalfl.com. Uh, there is a slash S at the end, but you'll see it through the Orange County website. You hit the, you know, reg uh, vaccine registration information button right there on the right, and, and it'll take you to the portal. Um, yeah, if you have any questions or something doesn't look right, just reach out, mm -hmm. you know, either to us or to, you know, go back to the Orange County site, call, you know, because rather, you know, be safe than sorry. Um, we do not want any predatory behavior getting past us and mm -hmm. I know that Orange County um, has a, 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 a pretty rigorous fraud uh, detection unit so if you see something fishy let people know so mm -hmm. that they can they can act on that yeah currently um, Ann put these stats together so thank you Ann um, currently Orange County ranks third in the state for the highest number of new cases but the good news is that right now they're able to disperse the county is able to disperse the highest number of vaccines because of the capacity, the freezer capacity, 
um, they're able to disperse both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, which is great. They, they started planning this months ago. They're, when they, when they, I thought it was such a, I have to brag on them because I know that, it, like I said, that nothing's perfect, but I wanna make sure that I'm telling you when I feel like things are done the way that they should be done. Mm -hmm. When trials looked like they were being successful, mm -hmm. Orange County made a calculated risk and invested in the right refrigeration mm -hmm. for this type of dissemination. So you're, that's, that's why you're seeing this, a, a very different story here in Orange County with the population size that, you know, we are what the fourth 1. largest? 1.4 million people. 1.4 million people. So, you know, that, that's a challenge just in logistics. So I think they did a, you know, a great job trying to anticipate what they would need. Mm -hmm. And if you want updates through text messaging, you can do OCFL COVID, all one word, to 888-777. Um, or you can go to the Orange County Facebook page. Yeah, um, the um, the individual and family assistance program application process is closed for now, and that was where Orange County got CARES acts and disseminated them through their application process. Um, if you've been following the, the news, the national news, there are there's another act that went through. There mm -hmm. should be more funding coming along. We will make sure to keep you updated as soon as we get that, um, mm -hmm. once they get that in-house. Once again, right now, it, they have a process. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully they'll be able to turn it around very quickly once yeah. it comes in. I think they said January 15th will be the new okay. portal. I, they mentioned that in the meeting, but Anne's saying that's probably not. Yeah, we'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to you update you. on that because that is something that, um, you know, I know that we're, we're a little bit dependent on the way that the federal government allocates and disseminates that Mm -hmm. um, I know that you had brought up mental health as a huge, um, a huge yeah. ask, and I know that you brought up Aspire. Uh, we do have another briefing that will be coming up all about mental health resources with the county, but I know that that's one of your. It is, and it's still. I, I mean, I've said, like I, I think I'm a, like a broken record on this one because I know that it's just hard, right? So I, I we talked about county resources, but also just, you know, just know if you're watching this. Mm -hmm. that a lot of it is just going to be us reading people around us right so just check in on the people that 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 you know may be isolated or alone or the people that you know may have a history of depression because if you are somebody who has a history of depression then there are enough precipitating factors for this to be a really a really hard time and i think we we are not out of that yet you know we talked about this during the holidays i think the holidays compound that because a lot of times it reminds we have you know grief that we're working through or some other trauma and the holidays just seem mm -hmm. to really magnify that but we will provide as much information as far as resources as we can mm -hmm. on a human level just you know do what you can to check on the people around you um even if it's somebody who you're like well they don't really want to talk to me it's because they're probably in the midst of a depression so you know sometimes it's okay to still say it's okay i just want you to know i'm checking on you and i worry about you and i love mm -hmm. you and mm -hmm. um and then also you know for people who don't aren't comfortable with the kind of resources that we may be able to connect you with typically communities have religious leaders mm -hmm. um spiritual non-spiritual leaders sometimes non-denominational leaders sometimes mm -hmm. there are community mm -hmm. leaders people that you know that you've known a teacher a trusted friend lean on those people right now and even if it's just to ask them what they think the next thing should be if you mm -hmm. are if you're really struggling because just we're human and we're all going we're all going through we're all going through this and mm -hmm. i think you know i think there are days that i feel like whoa we're coming out this is good all was good mm -hmm. and then there are days where like the weight of the world just feels crushing and mm -hmm. and so with the support that i have around me if i'm feeling that i know people who may not have the kind of support are, are get feeling that worse and i just want to make sure that you know that we're, we're here for for you to try to reach out and let us connect you um or reach out to whoever you you can yeah and the county has other you know partnerships out in the community too um you know you can contact united way uh united against poverty uh christian service center just email us if you have specific yeah. questions um and you know before we start taking um before we start taking questions from people in the comments, um, there are two things I wanted to remind you to also update the constituents about um, the CFX meeting and Vision 2020. Okay, Vision 2050 is or 2050. The, excuse me. It's okay. Mm -hmm. the, it's um, it um, it is the 
comprehensive plan meetings that are going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, January 20th at 6 p.m. is the one for what they're calling the Western Market. I don't know, I didn't name it, but it, it, it really is the one that closely um, mirrors District 1. But if you're watching this or you're interested in, in you live anywhere in Orange County, then it has on, if you go to um, Orange County website or you put in, just even if you Google Orange County Vision 2050, and we'll put a link in for this, um, it will take you to the, the presentations they've already done, um, which include some maps of how the, the, um, the planners here in the county have been trying to look at decision making in the next part of our, our Orange County's planning. Um, it gives you an opportunity to public comment. The other one that, that it, it's really important if you think about planning and development and growth and the issues that we have with growth that have really plagued us and you know, people wonder why their hands are tied often in trying to modify those plans. It's because they were part of something called a comprehensive plan, which then requires you know, a lot more work to adapt or adopt a change in a comprehensive plan. So what we'd like to do is get it right, right? The, concept, the update to the comprehensive plan um, with what the community wants so that we aren't continually trying to get around that planning. Um, so it's, it's the time that we have to really get involved. The next one is CFX should have sent out, I think, uh, reminders to um, the public in areas that this is gonna impact the most. Um, I know there's also, if you get updated um, newsletters from CFX, it should be in there. There will be a widening project to the 429 that will impact parts of winter, the Winter Garden area. Um, and there are two hearings, public hearings, where they want feedback from the public and that you can find out what their actual timeline is. Uh, January 20th and January 27th are the two dates that that's coming up. And once again, this is CFX planning. Um, so that's not Orange County, even though, you know, Orange County has, you know, representation on CFX. Um, that's not out of our out of our office. They, they made those plans. Um, the one on January 20th does conflict with the one, the, um, Orange 2050 um, comprehensive plan public meeting, but there are recordings of, I believe, I, I'm sure there'll be recordings of both because they're gonna be sunshine um, noticed. So you'll be able to get recordings of both and it shouldn't pre prevent you from being able to comment on anything you wanna comment on. So make sure that if um, that those things mean something, especially that widening project that will, when that starts happening, I know that sometimes it's difficult to express the comments after the fact. So this is the, the opportunity to express those comments um, to CFX and the Vision 2050, they'll be continuing to gather public feedback. So you know, don't feel panicked about that if you can't be there that night, just stay plugged in. If you have feelings about growth one way or the other or planning and development one way or the other in Orange County, um, it's an opportunity for you to document that and go on the record. And, you know, get your neighbors involved, get people involved. Like how many times do you hear, oh yeah, there was a hearing, but only three people or nine people showed up and that was a big number. Yeah. Like it, what? I know it blows my mind because, you know, and I think unfortunately it's a lot of times after the fact, um, some of that information feels more critical because you, you hope that what the people are doing in planning and engineering is intuitively good for your community, but that's, they can only do what they know to do and without knowing some of the nuances that you understand about your community or the historical, you know, relevance of certain things in your community. Those things are, are if you express them now, then mm -hmm. it, it is a much um, more, uh, gives them an advantage in the planning, long-term planning and zoning. And so, yeah, it's disappointing to hear sometimes the, the low turnout, but I don't always blame constituents or residents because I do think sometimes you're like, well, it's their job. They should be doing their job. Mm -hmm. It is, but more information for them is gonna be helpful in doing their job mm -hmm. and helping me express what you want because I'll know how to say, this is what the residents of, of District 1 are looking for in planning. Yep, yep. So maybe we can go ahead if there are any questions. Um, looks like there's some coming in. We have so many questions. Um, looks like most of them are about Horizon West. Um, so we have Kelly 
Rochelle asks, can we talk about Horizon West, please? Laura Betts says, good planning includes wildlife corridors. I am concerned about how Horizon West is not the model of smart growth as they advertise. Town centers, centers are not pedestrian oriented. Um, and I just want to make another note that she, Commissioner Wilson will have her first official briefing on Horizon West coming up next week. But keep going. We're with getting the into it yeah. now. This will be the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're exactly right. Um, Laura, I think that's Laura Betts from, yeah. Clio, from oh, the Clio Institute. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think that, you know, there's going to be a couple different things. So we're going to look at where those variances, because Horizon West is different. It has its own comprehensive plan. And that's not to say that the next comprehensive plan that you shouldn't be giving input for, because you, you'll need to do that. But what I think is frustrating for people that live there is that what was put in that comprehensive plan has then been varianced away quite a bit in, in chunks. And unfortunately, there are areas where, as, as a county, you know, we might have to go back and look at why that or even really, actually, I think as citizens, I need to know exactly specifically where some of those places are. Go back and look w at what those variances look like. Clearly, it happened before I got here, but I do think that if it was part of that comprehensive plan to make sure that there was connectivity, that we have a very strong argument to be made, that we need to follow through and make sure that that's there. Moving forward, I think we need to include an abundance of clear and precise language about that type of pedestrian friendly walkability bikeability that doesn't allow for variances and then we need to protect any any of the um the public hearings that come up where people are looking for um a waiver or a way to get around those those things that were put into the comprehensive plan or into code so next week at the tuesday meeting um, District 1 has nominees for um, the Board of Zoning Adjustment and the Planning and Development um, Oversight Board and for uh, several others. And so we have some really outstanding citizens who have volunteered their time and energy to participate in um, sitting on those boards. What that's going to entail then is that when there's an application for a variance in zoning, when there's an, applica an application for some um, use change for a piece of property, that, that they will have kind of a first look at it, um, or second look at it really, but they'll get a look at that and they'll get an opportunity to raise questions about why. And then before it ever gets to the Board of County Commissioners, we have more information. And so, you know, we really, as, a, as an office, we've all been working really hard to try to figure out exactly how we can within the boundaries of our of our, our codes and ordinances here affect that change and it appears that we have to do it right when those applications come in so or that's a huge part of it so you know that that is one component so i look forward to and i thank the the the, the people who volunteered to be part of those boards on behalf of our community that's you know it's a it's a heavy lift and i'm very very grateful to you for sharing your time to do that um, and then if you have an interest in any of the boards that we have in Orange County, fill out an application. Um, we get to see those when they come in and that way, if there is a, a board that's interesting to you that, that where that decision making process um, for a variety of things comes up, um, you have input and you can share that, that with us. So, and then to talk about the, you know, what I think the wildlife corridor issue, we, are researching and want to continue to research ways that we can get um, some some critical land and I think that is going to be a priority for us to try to to locate and acquire um, some land I think we're going to need to also go into some public private partnerships in order to get some of the other things that we really wanted to see um, to keep that wildlife corridor protected because you know, right in that area, we have uh, a lot of residents that go in to work at, at Disney, and we want to make sure that we 
there or neighbor there and that if they can help and I think we can all agree we want the people that work there to be safe we want the wildlife to be safe um, so if we know what the problem is mm -hmm. then we can we can ask for that partnership to try to come up with some of the mm -hmm. um, solutions all right any other questions that have come in Laura that's also says the early maps when we were sold our homes showed green areas that are now developed into commercial property and Andrea Burnup says, my concern also, where are the greenways that were part of the original plants? Uh, finally, Laura Betts also says, thank you, Nicole, for this informative session. We can't blame you for planning mistakes that happened in the past. I am confident you will represent our best interests moving forward. Thank you. That's a huge honor, and I appreciate the kind words. I do think it is frustrating for us. It's frustrating for me because I think you were you were promised something and got something else. But I think what we have to do going forward, because we're not you know we're not going to be able to probably undo whatever go has gone in there. But we can try to find opportunities, existing opportunities, future opportunities to hold on to what green we have left. And the more to me the the be the we have a better argument to try to acquire those and hold on to them, um, the more meaningful they are, which takes me back to Noah's notes and how important that study was. Because when you can see how critical some of those parcels, some of those, those pieces of, of property are, then we have a much better argument going forward about why we need to acquire them for, for the future of our county. That being said, I, I would like um, to maybe, Laura, if we have a chance to set up a meeting, because I would like to even go back and, and ask somebody here <laughs> who was here during the time that those decisions were made, you know, because usually if staff approves it and it goes in front of the board and then it, so that variance goes through those steps. So even though the outgoing administration or outgoing um, commissioner isn't or their office isn't here for me to ask that to, there should be people in the house that can tell me exactly why, how, where, and what do we do to prevent that? Because, you know, it's called comprehensive mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's you know there's reason why we put these things in code and I think it's it's difficult because once again it get you know it erodes that trust mm -hmm. it erodes that trust if you know if, if you can't trust that what you're being told the the county's going to do to protect your your neighborhood um it's you know it's hard for us to earn that back and I and I mm -hmm. yeah well, if they're like yeah buy this home, look at all these green spaces, and they use it as a, as a sales pitch to get the first phase of homes sold, and then they develop the second well, phase. And you know, you're talking about sophisticated, these are sophisticated residents, right? So it was probably originally platted as some kind of a, a, a communal property, which then means, you know, do we go back and look at the language for how those things are designated mm -hmm. in, a, in a development plan? Mm -hmm. And do we make sure that there's not an asterisk somewhere that allows for that to be a bait and switch mm -hmm. because that's what it feels like is a bait and switch and i think mm -hmm. that's you know you, look take the take the fact that we're all kind of greenies here out of it and it's a consumer issue that's a consumer fraud. if you're told that you're going to get one thing you pay for the most expensive thing you've ever bought in your life and you don't mm -hmm. get what you were told I, that's a consumer issue so we yeah and you know just remember you know any questions that you have you know i try to answer all the emails as much as i can down to zero every day so, so district one at ocfl.net um last week we had questions about bird island and we secured a meeting with the commissioner to have with uh staff here internally so maybe next week we can plan on yeah, some updates yeah expect a, an update i know that we had um some involved Windermere residents that that were on and, and I want to make sure they know that I went back and, and looked at the minutes and and the um, meetings where it came up mm -hmm. in the fall actually here at the Board of County Commissioners and then I went back and did a little other research before talking to staff so that we'll be we'll have mm -hmm. all of our um, questions sort of lined up mm -hmm. if there are things not just questions but information you have that you think would be important that you don't know whether it it got to us feel, please feel free to send it um, we do not mind it, extra uh, homework information. Mm -hmm. it, does, it is very helpful, actually. So, Yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioner, so much for putting all this information together and working your, your tush off. I got, can I do a real quick shout out to the people mm -hmm. at the Convention Center? I got my, um, my very first ever tour at the Convention Center. I, I had only ever gone there to go to an event, and, and I think it was, um, it was 
very informative. They were very kind. And I got to see where people were coming through and getting the vaccinations. I got to see over at the testing site. And then I also got to see, um, you know, a little bit of, of what they're what they're struggling with um, as far as is trying to make sure people are feeling safe there. They're doing an outstanding job really trying to make sure that their protocols um, are keeping people who do come to visit safe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they really want to try to make sure that the community at large gets more information about them. So I think another one of these we could do like a little more in depth on some of the information they gave. It, it's, I don't, I didn't know a lot about it. It's not in my wheelhouse of, of um, expertise, but it is part of our county government, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. you know, it was designed as actually a, originally as a civic center slash convention center, but the convention center portion of it clearly was the growing part of it. And so it's part of, you know, our budget that really also incorporates the arts. It incorporates our, our um, sports facilities. And, and you know, I, I always get a little bit squirrely about the way that, that you know, government has those things in their purview because um, it, it doesn't come in the sort of traditional, what I feel like. But it is a, um, it's an interesting thing for our, for our constituents to understand the historical relevance and the economic drivers that come mm -hmm. uh, through that, that system. Mm -hmm. And um, so thank you. And thank, thank you, you for joining us, everybody. Um, next week, 4 o'clock on Friday, um, Commissioner Wilson will be putting together another office hour time block. Yeah, so. and if there's anything that we need to do, like a little specialty, one of these, or even a field trip, we'll do it. Um, mm -hmm. We, we mm -hmm. want to hear from you and we want to make sure that we're staying um, plugged in and that you guys have, uh, you know, that you have an interest in it. I think sometimes I can ramble about policy, so if that happens, cut me off, <laughs> move me on to something else. The geeky stuff sometimes I think is interesting and it's not. But we can answer or get into anything that you guys think is interesting or that we can help explain. And if you're a community organizer or a leader or the head of an HOA or some board and you have a large audience and you want to get them in front of the commissioner or help with planning a community event, I can't even tell you how many people have proactively gone out of their way to it, introduce it. themselves so that they can lead events on behalf of the commissioner so that really my job it's is easier and it's, it's like, the best thing ever so if you are one of those people please email district one at ocfl.net so that we can start to work on some meet and greets in february and march yeah thank you and i it makes me it makes life so much not just it's rewarding so yeah mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you thank you have a wonderful happy night weekend. happy weekend everybody <laughs>